And I'm Ron Kuby sitting in today for Jack Ford. And joining us, Tamara Holder, a Chicago-based criminal defense attorney who also does civil rights and personal injury law, and seriously mentally ill defendants. They're almost always found competent to stand trial. We want to use an insanity defense. They say no insanity defense. What can we do? Well, we can't do much. We just we have to listen to our client. But remember that the attorney gets to make decisions as how the case is going to go. But I have a real problem in in this case because why, if he was found competent, why was the prosecution then allowed to bring in evidence that he was delusional and had mental problems? If he is found competent, all conversations or all discussions about any mental issues should have been entirely left out. I guess it doesn't really matter because he was found guilty in the end, but mental, a history of mental illness where you're found competent should then result in no discussion of his mental illness whatsoever. Okay, Art Brown, how, how did the evidence uh, regarding his delusions come out? Did that simply come out in, in the course of, of listening to him speak to uh, uh, the detective or did it come out in other areas as well? It mostly came out in his own statement to, to Detective Alvarado. Now, the defense asked for certain portions of that statement to be redacted, but other portions where he's uh, enunciating his theories about uh, the CIA, they did not ask to be redacted out of the statement. So it was a defense decision, uh, ultimately, a strategic decision on the part of the defense. Tamara, if, if that's the case, and I assume Brother Brown is telling me the truth, right. That's what you get, right? Well, there's, that's no, what you get. there's no recourse there. And now maybe that's an appellate issue. Oh, right. <laughs> Any, there are well, going to be appellate, be an appellate issues. issue, Chris. Right. And, I, and that brings I, us to the question of mental health care in prisons. Correct. Too. And this is a Florida case, as we know, but in California, a three judge uh, federal court judge panel found that the prisons in California were so overcrowded 1.5 million people, one person a day in California prisons were di was dying, one person a day, and they told them they must reduce their population by 500,000 within three years. Why? Because people were dying in prison because they were not getting the care that they need. So we're going to say, let's put this man in prison for less than life, but we know that he's not going to get the care that he needs. Why? Because we don't provide for it, and number two, he doesn't want it. So what are we going to do? We are going to put this person back on the streets to no. well, reoffend? No, 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 we are certainly not putting him back think, on the streets. I don't think that's the option, though. I mean, that, what that, is I the mean, option? The option is that it, once people, once you have somebody in custody, I mean, you can treat them in ways that you can't necessarily do if they have to volunteer for it. Do you know what I mean? If the ultimate idea is to rehabilitate people and get them back to the point that they're sane and not thinking the CIA is coming after them, you know, the way to do that seems to be to get them out, which speaks to Tamara's point. We don't need overcrowding in prison anyway. Do we really need to keep this guy in prison but we for the don't rest treat of his them life? In prison. But that but that means we need to make them well, be treated wait, wait, in prison, wait, wait, as this, opposed to just saying we're we not going to treat them. We don't provide for this, it, let alone making it. This all presupposes that that there is some sort of easy psychiatric fix to Mr. Fast's problem. This is a guy that you don't need to keep him in jail for the rest of his life, no matter what his violent proclivities may have been before he went in. Sometimes. Some, but doesn't and everybody deserve the shot? not. But, but with life, letters and not numbers, he's never coming out. He's never going to get that shot. And how horrible would it be to be trapped in your own mind? That's and, and, not true, and, and, though, that he's never coming out. Remember, there are appeals issues here, possibly. Anybody so relying on an I'm not, appeal? No, no, no. I'm not saying that, but there are plenty of cases where you're not relying on an appeal and the, the appeal is successful. So in the meantime, if there's an appeal pending, we still must treat pe people in prison who have mental illnesses, even if we think that they're never getting out. This right. I, I think that's absolutely right. And, and I want to close it with Art Brown. Art, um, what is the status of mental health care treatment in, in Florida's prisons? Uh, I believe that in, inmates uh, committed to the Department of Corrections do get uh, treatment. They are evaluated by psychologists and psychiatrists within the prison system. But do you have any real sense of, of, of how effective those treatments are, the nature of the evaluation, the nature of the treatments, um, anything like that? I do not. Yeah. I don't either, unfortunately. Um, you guys? Uh, uh, Tamara sounds like the expert on this, but I'm betting it's not real good. I, I, it's I not, take it's that terrible. Back. And, and yeah. California, of course, incarcerates the most amount of people out of all the states, and, along with Texas. And so they are the leaders in over incarceration, under treatment. Okay.
And so that's what we should follow. Um, and as a general matter, um, when you are looking for mental health care treatment, when you're looking for centers that treat mental illness, usually something that ends with the word state prison system is not one of the places where people go no. if they have a choice. Well, our, and, and Tamara Holder, it's interesting. Judges will do that, right? They'll, they'll actually protect the prosecution from itself sometimes because their tendency is to overtry the case. Correct. And the judges are always looking out for the appellate issues as well. And they don't want to get reversed because they allowed something to come in that shouldn't have come in or that's questionable. And of course, you can make the argument that a good judge is, is going to make the right decision or, or a decision and stick with it. And uh, but, but this is one of those things that's a borderline because this is an exception to the hearsay rule, this state of mind. And so, uh, it, so it's a little questionable. It is questionable. And, and the reason I, I raise it here is that this is a, an area where a judge has tremendous discretion. Nobody's uh, going to get They over may that. bring empathy to bear. They may bring their life's experience to bear. They may bring their own feeling that, hey, I think this guy's going to be found guilty. I don't want to get reversed on appeal here, so I'm going to exclude it. They're not just calling balls and strikes. They're doing something else, right? Right, and what's interesting about this case with this with this alleged hearsay is that if the defense is pointing to the husband, then they don't you don't want the prosecution to come in and say, well, the the person that we're accused that the defense is accusing of committing this crime said he's pointing it at the other guy right. by his wife saying that she thought that he was going to kill her. So he's protecting that from even coming in so they can say, yes, he, he already had it planned. This husband had it planned. And look what he's doing. He's saying that my guy killed her or wanted to kill her. And, and this is a you know, motive right. or a common plan. Welcome back to Courtside. I'm Ron Kuby sitting in for Jack Ford today and joining us today for the historic confirmation hearings of Sonia Sotomayor, the esteemed Burt Newborn. He is a constitutional law scholar, an expert on procedure and evidence. He's the legal director of the Brennan Center for Justice at the New York University School of Law, one of the nation's most active civil liberties lawyers, and, and he starred in a movie with Woody Harrelson and Courtney Love. And rejoining us is Tamara Holder, a Chicago-based criminal defense attorney who also practices civil rights and personal injury law and has not been in a movie with Woody Harrelson or Courtney Love. Let's go back inside the hearing room right now, continuing to watch the confirmation hearings of Judge Sonia Sotomayor. Um, uh, Tamara Holder, just as a, as a matter of, of good citizenship, would we be better served if, if our Supreme Court nominees were encouraged to be a little more forthcoming about their views. Look, President Obama won the election. He gets to appoint his justices. Um, George Bush won the election. He got to appoint his. That's, that's the way it works. And not to minimize the advise and consent function, but it would be nice to know what the Senate is actually consenting to when it consents. I, I agree. I think that we need to make sure that we understand their feelings outside of the bench. Uh, I was talking to Reverend Jesse Jackson about racial sensitivity and colorblindness, and no, he says nobody wants to be blind at anything. And it was an interesting comment because we want to understand where her comments of the wise Lat Latina woman come from. It comes from her experience growing up in the Bronx as, as a minority. It comes from everything that she brings to the table. We don't want everybody to be a robot, white, black, Latino. We want everybody to bring something different to the table and we want to know what it is. We want to know you bring something different to the table, what is it and how do you feel about these issues? For her to make a comment that she's a wise Latina woman well, is not a theoretical wise Latina woman. She didn't actually say that she was. Right, <laughs> right. Oh, right. she is. <laughs> <laughs> and she is, and she should, and, and we took that statement out of context. We, she said that with her, ex, a, a wise Latina woman with her experience, which means that she brings something to the table. With what experience? Was it that you grew up in the projects? Was it that you, um, uh, wh whatever it is, was it that you had a father that you lost at a very young age because he couldn't get the health care that he needed, because you were poor? What are those things that you bring to the table that will change or sway your opinions when you're on the Supreme Court? I want to know those things. Right. I, I would, too, but uh, let's get a final thought from our guest. Tamara Holder, uh, you've been watching the hearings. What say you? 
I think that the hearings are interesting because she is so contained. She uses words like case-by-case -case basis, precedent, four corners of the law. So these are words, this, this is like textbook constitutional law. But it's going to be a lot different once she's confirmed and on the bench. I think that it's, it'll be interesting to see how she is on the bench because it is not going to be certain legalese and language like this. Uh, Professor Newborn. Oh, I think she's